Okay, g'day all, welcome to another video. So today I want to talk about something, uh, a brand new topic, something really, really interesting. Uh, this is a mechanism or a technique in, uh, in low level programming, usually. Um, so this technique, I didn't want to make a video on it for a long time because it's, it's seen as a little bit dangerous, a little bit hacky. Uh, but it's super, super interesting and um, yeah, we're going to have a look at it today. So this, this technique was used by, or, or has been used by, probably still is used by virus authors. Uh, to hide their malicious software from uh, virus protection software. Uh, but it's also got many legitimate uses as well, and it's just absolutely fascinating, so let's have a bit of a look. Uh, it's one of assembly language's greatest tricks. It's one of the most intriguing and confusing and powerful tools of all programming. And it's also one of the most unknown tools and one of the most misused. Now, there's a couple of ways to do what we're about to do. Uh, today we're going to have a look at the easy and the safe way to do it. Uh, if there's any interest, we can have a look a bit later at a different way to do it. But yeah, today's just going to be a simple introduction. Alrighty, so what are we talking about? Um, <laughs> we're talking about something called self-modifying code. Now, first of all, I just want to mention that self-modifying code is all over the place. It's in uh, C++, it's in every language basically. Uh, it's all over the shop. So here's a, here's a little example just here of what I mean. So this is a, a, just a little program that gets, gets some numbers from the user. So input a number and we read this uh, variable just here from the user. Input times and we read this variable from the user. And then we want to run a loop, a for loop, which iterates the number of times specified in the times variable. And it just adds number to result. So really what we're doing here is multiplying number by times and outputting the result. If we run this program and have a bit of a look uh, if I type 5 and 4, there you go. So 5 times 4 is 20. Fair enough. But what's interesting about this program is that this variable just here, times, changes the way that the program executes. So the program doesn't do the same thing every time it's run. If I put in 4 just there, uh, this loop will iterate 4 times. If I put in 3, it's going to iterate 3 times. So what we're doing is changing the way the program executes at runtime, and that, my friends, is self-modifying code, which is the topic of today. Um, all right, so in the general sense, this is self-modifying code, and there's lots of other things in, in high-level languages that allow self-modifying code. You've got, you know, loops and, and if statements and um, polymorphism, all sorts of different things allow self-modifying code, but there is another type of self-modifying code which we're about to look at, and it's something that assembly is great at. So, uh, when you've got a program, it's something like this. You've got your variables in RAM at some point. Uh, you've got your stack segment, spelled correctly, uh, at some point in RAM, and you've also got your code at some point in RAM. So, these different places in RAM belong to pages. And what the operating system does is it marks pages for various access rights. Um, some pages it allows you to read and write, some pages it allows you to execute, etc, etc. Um, so, if we just jump over to assembly, uh, I've already set this program up to include uh, assembly files in the build customization, and I've already set it up to 64-bit as well. So if you don't know how to do that, maybe watch another video. But let's jump over to assembly where I've got a little function just here called sum function. And all it does is it takes a parameter in ECX and it adds 5 to that and returns it. Yeah, nice and easy. So let's make our little um, thingo. Okay, so if I run this function just here and pass the parameter, say, 100 to it, um, we should get 105. All things going to plan. <laughs> um, result. Endle. Some function with a capital F. Uh, there we go. Yeah, 105, 105. So that's that's not confusing. We haven't modified any code. Uh, but let's have a bit of a look at something. So this code just here, dot code. Um, this is actually a macro, or it's a simple version of something else. It's a simple version of something else. And what it's a simple version of is something like um, uh, read, execute, something like that. Okay, so code means this. 
it means we want a segment in RAM, we want our Windows to give us a page, or more maybe, in RAM, and we want to be able to read the data on that page, and we want to be able to execute the data on that page. So if we just get rid of this code just here and run our program again, we should see that exactly the same thing happens. There we go, 105, 105. So we can read and execute our little uh, code segment, even when we specify the segment uh, properties ourselves, rather than using the macro code. Uh, now things are going to get a little bit a little bit strange. So for one thing, I'm going to add no op to the end of this add just here for reasons that will become clear in a moment. I'm also going to add a label just above this add instruction. Then I'm going to do something really weird. I'm going to say uh, mov a d word ptr my label. Um, I have to read this. I don't remember the um, machine code. Oops, e eight eight three. Okay, so what have we just done then? Well, uh, nothing at the moment since uh, we have to do that first. Let's run our program now and see what happens. Would you look at that? It's not 105 anymore, it's 95. Is that a little bit strange? I'll say that's strange. What did we do just then? Why is it 95? Well, this is self-modifying code, my friends. This is how it works. So we've got my segment, and we specify it as a segment in RAM that we can read, we can write, and we can execute. And then we set a label down here, just so that we can reference this instruction right here. And we move to that label, this machine code just here, 83E80590. This machine code just here happens to be the machine code for sub EAX5. Very, very cool. So if we run this, uh, what we see is um, that 5 is subtracted from our parameter, yeah, which is 100. Uh, if we passed another parameter, say we passed like 45, uh, we'll get 40 back. Easy as that. So the reason why I put a no op down here, which is uh, this 90 just here, is because the sub EAX5 instruction is actually only 3 bytes long. Yeah, and we want to move uh, a D word pointer. Yeah, so we have to put in the 90 there, otherwise um, we would be overriding this ret instruction down here. Anyway, I hope that's interesting to you. I hope you can see what we've done just there and, and, and kind of realize that in a way that's very, very strange. Um, we can code machine code at runtime, self-modifying code. All right, before we go, I just want to mention a couple of legitimate ways that this is, uh, this is useful. So it's really, really useful for high-performance scripting languages. So if you want to write something like um, a JavaScript compiler or, or something, you know, interpreter, something that runs JavaScript at breakneck speed, um, what you need to do is convert the JavaScript into assembly language. And you can do that with uh, self-modifying code. It's also useful for patching data at runtime. So if you've got a program that's got problems, you might write a patch for it that runs, you know, right when the program begins execution and fixes up the problems that would later otherwise occur. Uh, it's useful for code obfuscation as well. So if you think back to the uh, back to the days when we used to have uh, CD checkers for games, um, there was often a an instruction, yeah, or a system call where the CD would have to be checked. Uh, for the game to make sure that you're a legitimate user and what what people used to do was um, just remove that CD checking instruction they'd just replace it with no ops and just tell the program that you know the CD did check okay and uh, that was called a no CD crack I think yeah yeah they would just patch the exe file so that they didn't need CDs um, so what you can do to get around that if you're a games company is you can hide the instruction to check the CD in the first place. You can hide it and just, you know, obfuscate it in some way and uh, change it at runtime so that people can't so easily patch your EXE file. Uh, it's also good for encrypted code. So if you want to run uh, an algorithm but it's very sensitive, maybe you want to encrypt your code, you don't want to have it available as machine code since it could just be disassembled. So you could encrypt your code and unencrypt it at runtime using self-modifying code. Uh, it's useful for runtime compression as well. This is something that used to be used uh, a lot more than it is since we've got so much RAM nowadays. But um, there's just amazing tricks that people used to do with self-modifying code uh, in order to save RAM. Unbelievable stuff.
Uh, another really interesting thing that you can do with this is self-writing evolution algorithms. This is absolutely bizarre, but you can set up a bunch of uh, automaton, I guess, uh, to write their own code in uh, x86 assembly language and uh, execute it and see what happens. I personally think that's absolutely crazy. I mean, anything at all can happen if you allow the computer to write its own assembly. Uh, probably just going to crash, really. Anyway, those are some legitimate uses of um, self-modifying code. I hope that's been an interesting little video. And if there's any interest, we can uh, maybe have a look at how these opcodes work, how the machine code works, and uh, yeah, look in the future at other self-modifying code topics, such as how to change a page at runtime. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a good one. See ya.